What do you do when you hear someone, uh, we overhear someone talking nonsense to their friends? Something that you are sure is just not right, incorrect. Uh, do you say something? Or would you keep quiet? Well, it would probably depend on your relationship to those people. Do you know the person speaking? Do you know the people that he or she is speaking to? If you do, maybe you would say something. But if you're just overhearing a conversation in the train, uh, you might decide it's none of your business to intervene and point out uh, the thing that's been said that's wrong. It would also depend, wouldn't it, on the seriousness of what they're saying. If you hear someone telling their friends that all the trains for London go from platform one, uh, and you know for sure they go from platform two, you might be willing to say something even to a stranger. But if it's about something trivial, uh, like how many goals were score scored in the World Cup back in the 1970-something, you might just let it go and decide it doesn't really matter. Here um, we have some men from Judea who have come to Antioch and who've started telling the Christians there about Jewish laws. And Paul and Barnabas react strongly. They choose to say something. If you've got it open, have a look at verse 1 and 2. Some men came down from Judea. To us, that would be going up because they're going north, but it's always down from Jerusalem. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. Why? Is that because Paul and Barnabas love getting into arguments? They love making trouble. I don't think so. Uh, Paul is the one who wrote to Titus to avoid foolish controversies. He's the one who wrote to the Corinthians saying that he appealed to them to agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. Paul was not interested in people just arguing for no reason. And Barnabas, his name, of course, means son of encouragement. Rather, Paul and Barnabas seemed to think that the teaching of these visitors from Judea was something dangerous, dangerous error, and would harm the members of the church in Antioch, their brothers and sisters in Christ. And so they had, they had to say something. Acts, the book of Acts, uh, is short for the Acts of the Apostles, but it's not just about what the apostles do, it's about what the Holy Spirit is doing. In fact, it's about what the risen Lord Jesus is doing through the Holy Spirit and through his apostles. The person who's clearly in charge right through the book of Acts is Jesus. The gospel is not Paul's gospel or Barnabas' gospel, it's Jesus' gospel. So behind Paul and Barnabas' opposition to what these teachers from Judea are saying is the opposition of Jesus to what they're saying. Jesus is the good shepherd who loves his flock, who cares deeply what they're being fed. And if they're being fed something that is poisonous weeds, well then Jesus cares about that. He wants them to receive life-giving truth instead. So what does Jesus do about dangerous errors in the church in his church. Jesus, as we shall see here, he protects his gospel and he builds up the church, even in the face of destructive errors. So first of all, we see Jesus acting through his apostles to clarify the gospel, to make clear what the gospel, the good news of Jesus, actually is. Uh, verse uh, two, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. So these visitors who've come with this teaching, they're not driven out of town, they're not silenced, but they are debated vigorously. 
And then the church realizes that look, this is not going to be settled here in Antioch. Uh, the visitors have come up from Jerusalem. We need to uh, send people down there. That's the birthplace of the church. That's still its center at this point. Uh, we need people to go down there and a full meeting of the apostles and the elders to settle the question. And what is the question that they've got to settle? It's this one. How can a person be saved? What does a person have to do to be saved? We, of course, all of us have foolishly and deliberately rebelled against our creator. And our consciences tell us, when we don't silence them, we're not going to survive meeting him face to face. We deserve his condemnation. How can we be saved from that? Well, the Gentiles, those, those who were not Jews but had become Christians, they'd been told that Jesus would save them. They just needed to put his, their trust in him. But now these others who've come from Judea are saying, well, that, it's not just that. Uh, you need to also become Jews. You need to accept circumcision. You need to start living by the whole of the Jewish Old Testament law. If you don't do that, end of verse 1, you cannot be saved. And if you take verse 1 and verse 5 together, you get this full picture of what these people are teaching. That the, the, the Gentile Christians must also be circumcised. They must keep the whole Old Testament law or else they cannot be saved. Now, of course, as Christians, we must keep the Old Testament laws or certainly the laws that are what we might call creation laws the laws that are binding for all time. Do not murder, because all people are made in God's image. Do not commit adultery, because marriage matters to God. Uh, you shall have no other gods before me, because we're God's creatures, and he deserves our worship. But these teachers from uh, Jerusalem wanted all Christians, the Gentile Christians, to be bound forever by all the laws, including the, re the, the redemption laws, the laws that include the food laws and the animal sacrifice laws uh, and all the rest of it. The, the laws that were fulfilled and transformed by Jesus' coming and Jesus' self-sacrifice on the cross. Verse 7 says that this gathering in uh, Jerusalem uh, consisted of much discussion. There was a lot of talking. But the apostles and elders realize as they discuss that what these people are saying is wrong. Circumcision and keeping the whole of the Old Testament law are not necessary for salvation. Verse Seven onwards, uh, Peter backs that up because he remembers how he told Cornelius the centurion uh, that they just needed to trust in Jesus and they would receive forgiveness of sins. And Peter remembers how God's Holy Spirit was poured out on Cornelius and his household as confirmation that he just needed to trust in Jesus. Verse 8. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us, to the Jewish Christians. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. And so he says, why are you weighing these people down with these rules that are not necessary? Why do you, verse 10, why do you try to test God? Why are you provoking God's anger by saying these things? Verse 11, no, we believe it is through the grace, through the undeserved kindness of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they, the Gentiles, are. So the conclusion of the council is that we are saved by faith, by trust, in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ alone, and not in any other way. Verse 12, Paul and Barnabas back that up because uh, they have been enabled as apostles to do miraculous signs that have confirmed the message that they're preaching to the Gentiles. Why would God have enabled them to do those miraculous signs if he wasn't happy with the message that they were proclaiming? 
And finally, verse 15 onwards, they realize that the Bible, God's word, spoken through the prophets, backs up this conclusion. Uh, they quote from uh, Amos here uh, in verse 16. Uh, Amos says that David's tent or house or, or kingdom will be rebuilt and it will include, verse 17, the Gentiles, not just the Jews. And Jesus, God's son, is the one who rebuilds David's kingdom. And when that message goes out, both Jew and Gentile, simply by trusting in Jesus, uh, are um, saved, are rescued from God's condemnation. So this, all this talk, all this meeting to clarify what the gospel is, what the Bible teaches. Sometimes, of course, down the centuries, Christians have resorted to violence against other Christians to settle disputes. Sometimes Christians have dishonored Christ by going beyond a legitimate use of force. But although that has tragically happened, that actually has not been the norm. There have been many times, too, when Christians have followed the example set here in Acts chapter 15. In fact, the historical records are full of accounts of church synods, church councils, meetings, discussions, sometimes very local, sometimes people from all across the world getting together to talk, to discuss, to debate what the truth is, to hear how the Holy Spirit seems to have been leading the church and, and to submit everything, all arguments, all experiences, all reasoning to the authority of the scriptures, to see what it is that God has said, what is the truth. I could give you lots of examples, but I'll just give you one. In the year 325 AD, uh, a council was held uh, in Nicaea, which would today be in Turkey, uh, and that was a gathering of Christian leaders from across, well, from across the world, the, the world of that day. They had lots of things on the agenda, but some of the things were the question, is Jesus the eternal Son of God, or did the Father create him? They uh, debated how they were supposed to work out the date of Easter each year, because there had been some disagreements over that. They talked about what is appropriate behavior for clergy. And they uh, produced the first version of what we now call the Nicene Creed. All that was on the agenda and lots more. Jesus said that he would send his Holy Spirit to lead the apostles into all truth. And we, we need to be interested in the truth because Jesus is the truth. We don't all agree all the time, do we? And sometimes our disagreements are quite serious. But if we follow the example of what happens in Acts chapter 15, we will be willing to work hard at coming to one mind on things. We will go and meet with people. We will discuss, we will talk, we will listen. We'll open up our Bibles and, and dig into them to try and find out what is the truth. It's always sad, and it happens from time to time, it's sad when people leave the church uh, because of disagreements. But to me, the greatest sadness is when people won't talk about those disagreements, when they say, I, I don't want to discuss it. I don't want to talk about it. Don't we believe that the Holy Spirit is able to bring us ultimately to one mind, the mind of Christ? Don't we believe that he can bring us to maturity together? And that's what he's been doing. The, the church has been reflecting on the Bible over the centuries and some things that were a puzzle back in the first century, like you know, what do we do about these Gentiles and do they have to be circumcised or not? Those things are settled. And there's still lots of other things to discuss and grasp. But many questions down the centuries have been settled and agreed on by large numbers of Christians across the world. We're not going round in circles on this, even though we have setbacks from time to time. So there's an encouragement to us. Get reading. Get reading the Bible. Get reading other Christian books. Get talking. Get discussing. Join one of the home groups. Ask me about study courses, ways in which you can grow in your knowledge of what God has said. And expect God to help you 
to grow in that. So there's this big meeting and they clarify, uh, they come to a conclusion about the, the truth of the gospel and what they should do. What do, they, what do they do with that? Or what does Jesus lead the apostles to do with that? To defend the church. Have a look at verse 19. This is Simon Peter speaking. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. So having met and had these long discussions, the, the, the end result is, is not just to publish a book or something like that. They want to use the truth that they have agreed on to help people, to help their Gentile brothers and sisters in Christ who were being troubled and disturbed by what other people were incorrectly telling them. And that's what they say in that letter that they send back to Antioch. So verse 23, they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. We've heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who've risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. Here's the danger that they see, that if the Gentiles are told that they must now be circumcised and keep all the Old Testament laws, some of them probably are just going to give up because that's not what they signed up for. And others who perhaps believe that are going to stop trusting in Christ's finished work on the cross and start depending on their own rule keeping as a way of being justified before God. The question here is, have they grasped the difference between the person who says, I think I can keep God's standards if I just try a bit harder, and the person who says, no, Christ has kept God's standards on my behalf. He's paid the penalty for my failure, and I am trusting in him alone. So this decision reached by the council in Jerusalem had to lead to action. They had to take steps to say no to those who were teaching something different and to write and make clear to the Christians what it was that they did need to believe. There are uh, in the Christian life some disputable matters, some things that are very much secondary issues. We ought not be getting into big arguments over those, although we shouldn't be afraid of talking about them either. But when something is taught that is clearly another gospel, a non-gospel, then we have to speak up clearly, and church leaders particularly must speak up clearly. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Some people say Edmund Burke uh, wrote that. Um, others say no, he didn't. Well, whoever wrote it, it was, it was helpful. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. We have to speak up when people are in, in danger from things that are wrong. Um, I suspect that a, a good training for a church leader, and perhaps this should be suggested to the colleges, is that every trainee vicar should have a spell as a shepherd. Um, particularly a shepherd of sheep that are free to roam the hills uh, along with lions and wolves. That would be good training for us. Because I guess we would soon learn to resist the predators rather than have to watch the sheep being torn apart. That's a responsibility that I feel uh, for you. There are so many different views circulating out there in, in the wider church so much teaching that sounds good until you take a look below the surface. Pray. Pray that I and the others who teach and lead here will that we'll have the diligence and the insight and the wisdom to, to spot what is being said and, and to be willing to warn you, to guide you, to warn you about poisonous weeds and to guide you to wholesome, nourishing, life-giving truth 
and decide that you're going to build up your own defenses by doing those things we've just talked about, by taking every opportunity to take in good spiritual food, Bible truth that will guide you away from ideas that are wrong and from movements and songs and internet sites that are really not going to help you, that are going to take you away from trusting in Christ. Jesus uh, acts through his apostles to defend the church, but also to build up the church, to build the church. Verse 28, second half of the, the letter that they wrote. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to, to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. It is uh, an encouraging letter. If you look on to verse 31, you see when the people read it, they were glad for its encouraging message. It built up the church by reminding them that yet simple faith in Jesus Christ, that's all they need. That's what will save them. That's what will rescue them from the the consequences and the, the power of sin. That's what will give them true freedom, trusting in Christ. But it also built up the church by holding people together. There was a great danger at this point that the church would divide into Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And although the Gentiles are not <coughs> subject to the whole of the Old Testament law, the letter asks them to abstain from four things. There in verse 29. Food sacrificed to idols, blood, the meat of strangled animals, and sexual immorality. I don't, I don't think that these are the only parts of the Old Testament redemption laws that are relevant to Christians. I don't think that all those four things are binding on all Christians for all time. But I think the leaders are laying this modest burden on the on the. Uh, Gentile Christians mostly for the sake of the Jewish Christians who they lived with at the time. It's similar to Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians 8 where he says, look, even if you know that an idol is nothing and therefore it doesn't really matter whether the meat you're eating has been sacrificed to an idol in the, down at the temple, even if you know that, if a Christian brother thinks it's wrong to eat it, then why don't you choose not to eat that meat for the sake of their conscience? That's the kind of thing that's going on here. The Gentile Christian and the Jewish Christian have got to live side by side. In, in the Roman Empire, the, the idol worship of the local, uh, the local pagan temple was an abomination to the Jew. Um, they would have avoid meat that had been offered to the idols there uh, and that had not been killed in a way that allowed the blood to drain out because of the Old Testament law that commanded that and the Jew of course avoided sexual immorality that was just rife in the pagan culture around them and centered on the temple the, the temple worship the uh, pagan temples so the letter says yeah Gentile Christians you are saved by faith in in Christ alone you're not being asked to keep all the Jewish laws but you would do well to avoid the sexual immorality of the culture around you, even those practices that perhaps just seem normal to you. And for the sake of your Jewish brothers, why don't you go and buy your meat from the Jewish butcher so that it won't have been offered to pagan idols? It, it may cost you a bit more, but that's the price of your love for your Jewish brothers and sisters, that you don't offend them in that way when you don't need to. And so Jesus' church grew as error was challenged and as Christians learned to live together, rejoicing in their freedom in Christ, but willingly giving up those freedoms if that would be what would hold them together as one body, as one family, both Jew and Gentile. Uh, somebody has said that Acts 15 shows us a victory for both truth and love. Truth, as they confirmed the gospel of grace, and love, as they preserved the fellowship by living together in a loving and sensitive way. 
What can you do to help the Church of Jesus Christ to continue to grow towards that maturity in him? Are there people here in this congregation that you could encourage, perhaps by getting together with them, to read the Bible and talk about it together? Uh, perhaps people that you can show patience to or kindness towards, people who come from a very different background from you or different interests, different levels of knowledge of the Bible, different maturity in their faith, but you can be kind and patient towards them because we are in this together. What does Jesus do about dangerous error in his church? He protects, defends, clarifies the gospel, and he builds his church despite these destructive errors that are circulating. And we need to believe that Jesus is still protecting and building his church. We need to aim to be those who encourage one another and are a builder of the church as God enables us to do that. Shall we pray together?